I had you on my podcast like what two years ago, and I haven't had you on since I mentioned you literally every single episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think I've mentioned you at least once almost every single episode. So uh, here you are. Yeah. I, I'm so honored by that. I am so honored. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're, I'm you're really very teary right now, just like so um, overwhelmed by gratitude. Hmm. Just, yeah. 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 Thank you for being in my life. Yeah. Thank you for being in my life. I, you know, feel the same about you. You're one of my favorite people on the planet. And I genuinely mean that. That's why I bring you up all the time. Um, yeah. And, you know, we were talking before this, it's like at some soul level, we, we know that we knew each other and there's several other people that we probably knew before who knew that this was going to be the plan for, for this lifetime. And then somehow we met back up and we're doing this work together and it's just really cool. Yeah. 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 I've been remembering more of my um, Qigong, Qigong old dude lifetime and um, remembering some different Qigong practices. And um, there was just this like um, yearning for the simplicity of that life but also um, coming to peace with the fact that this life is about loud children jumping on trampoline and Legos. <laughs> like I've got actually in the other room, four <laughs> loads of laundry that still needs to be folded. And um, like you couldn't have, you know, I mean, I think I had a good sense of humor when I was like planning out this lifetime mm-hmm. to Pass with that lifetime like okay how can it be like what how can I learn the maximum the other direction to be super in the world you know mm. yeah yeah and try to like strike a balance between the two or it's like it's not balance it's harmonizing the two right yeah I guess I guess for are we recording are we yeah. gonna start now yeah um I guess for a lot of people this lifetime is about that integration you know what does it look like to be practical to raise children to fold your laundry um you know to run a business Mm -hmm. to grow a garden it's pretty advanced stuff we're doing here Mm -hmm. all of that while spiritually awakened aware tuned in sensitive to all the different dimensions of energies at play it's some freaking advanced stuff we're doing. It is. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're calling this episode awakening consciousness through super wellness. And it's like, as we're coming up with that title, what hit me is that being, being well has to incorporate the the spiritual piece in it you know and your journey has been pretty incredible and i've heard it a few times and it's like all of it is interwoven together and like how do i put this it's Becoming super well has the ability to awaken you to these these other senses that we have, that all of us have. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like the pursuit of that can can lead people astray, like the pursuit of those extra senses. Does that make sense? Do you you, you get what I'm saying in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many directions we can take this conversation because I've um, gone through different periods of time. I think we all have different phases of our journey. And sometimes we get we start to open to new human possibilities and we get enamored with spoon bending, for yes, example. Yes, that's what this is. This is exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. Yeah, because I, I think I've brought this up on like three episodes. <laughs> So yeah. How's your, you still have your spoon. Right there? I literally have it on my desk at all times. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I have my, my bent spoon on my desk. It's a good okay. reminder though. It's a, it's an amazing reminder. Okay. So here's the thing. These are natural byproducts on the journey. And there's a lot of teachers, 
a lot of different people out there that have legit abilities, but it's just like anything else. Like you might be really good at snowboarding. I'm really good at swimming mm. or, you know, like, but does that mean you're an integrated, well-balanced mm. human being on all levels, body, mind, emotion, soul? Does that mean that you're a high integrity human being that I can trust you to help me say, raise my children or, mm. you know, to be a business partner that acts in integrity in the business sense and all of that. Right. So so on my journey, um, exploring new human possibilities, I discovered that there are people that have legitimate abilities in these different ways. And then I discovered that they, behind the scenes, some of them were extraordinarily high integrity human beings across the board. They're like moms and dads and business people. Their conduct behind the scenes backstage is consistently high quality. It's like, wow. That's to me, that's enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's that's true kindness and love in action in those practical senses. And then there's some people that talk a really good game. They have amazing social media memes. They're just good at that. But behind the scenes, it turns out that they don't operate in integrity with all of those things, mm -hmm. you know. So just be careful. Like the, some people might have spoon bending abilities, but it doesn't mean that they, they're good at, you know, working with other aspects of reality. They just happen to be good at working with metal with their consciousness, you know? Yeah. And what, what led you to awaken these abilities within you? Like you, just your whole journey. Let's start there. Okay. Well, the backpack story is that when I was four, I've shared this before, I think, with your, with your audience. When I was four, my dad and my sister had these different injuries. My dad had a back injury. My sister had a sw swollen ankle. And long story short, they tried every single thing in Western conventional medicine. Nothing worked. And my parents were like, we heard something about some sketchy Qigong master in some back alleyway in Hong Kong doesn't cost much. I guess we could just go and just like try it out. You know, what's the worst thing he can do? He like waves his hands and moves his chi and nothing happens. Right. Oh. And we lose like 10 bucks or something, you know? So they went and tried. And then one session, my dad's back was better. My sister's swollen ankle came right down one session. What did this, this, what did this guy do? He just emitted chi from his hands. That's all he did. That's what I was guessing. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm four years old. I'm like, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. Yeah. But all the adults, of course, this is my story. Now, you know, I, in hindsight, I so appreciate it. it was exactly the life path that I had signed up for to incarnate into a family that supposedly isn't open to these things, even though they saw with their own eyes, this healing, wow. they experienced yeah. in their own body, this healing, but they didn't want their daughter to do that because it meant being like, in a, you know, broke and in a back alleyway and apprenticing with some sketchy shaman healer guy, like they were not going to have me go down that life path. <laughs> I realized yeah. my life path was to go to school, get good grade, eventually get a math degree and get a corporate, you know, software job and hating it and go through that whole journey. That was actually what I needed to accomplish my dharma in this life. So I'm completely at peace with it at this point. Mm -hmm. But as a kid, I'm like, they won't let me do what I want to do, you know. Yeah. So it was a convoluted journey. I won't go into all the details of finally coming back to you know, some soul searching and deciding I, I do want to do Chinese medicine. I do want to be in the healing path. And I'm so grateful that in this lifetime, I had to go through, you know, immigrating to United States and being bilingual and like becoming a pretty high performing athlete. And all of that weaves into this work that I do today. You know, so I'm deeply grateful for the supposedly convoluted path. Because I think the new human that we're awakening into right now, all of us, is very multifaceted, multidimensional. We're all healers and we're all good entrepreneurs and business people. And we can grow a garden. You know, we might be tending our chickens, but we're also good at making Instagram memes. Like all of that is integrated together. That's the new human. And I had to walk this supposedly convoluted path in order to have all these 
skills that are needed to do this kind of work that you and I do, you know, so absolutely at peace with that, that what at that time, I couldn't see how the dots connected in my very convoluted path. But really, the the big, a lot of times that I start the story in 2003, I had started Chinese medicine school, and I was studying Chinese medicine, and just loving everything about Chinese medicine, because it's not just you know, like studying about acupuncture and herbs and these kinds of things, but you're re-patterning your relationship with life and the cosmos. Chinese medicine describes life in this beautiful way that every human being is here to be the conduit of heaven onto earth. They say that man is between heaven and earth, that every single human being, our purpose in this life is to channel through our version of heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. That's part of Chinese medicine, this understanding of the nature of reality and how we express health and is this harmonizing with the environment, harmonizing with the external environment, harmonizing with your internal environment is it recalibrated so much of my rigid Western thinking. So I loved all of that about Chinese medicine school, but my favorite part was honing your actual energetic sensitivity. So in acupuncture techniques class, we learn to subtly feel the different depths and layers of chi, the different channels, the different tissues, and the subtlety of that energy awareness. I just, it was so profound and meditative that it wasn't some philosophical understanding of, you know, like just memorize and regurgitate. There was some of that with the exams, but when you actually did the acupuncture techniques, you can feel like, oh, wow, I'm interacting. There's a tug at the needle and you can feel subtle pulls of energies and the person that you're working with, they feel a whole, this whole. And it's, not, and it's not procedural then. It's, it's very like based on feeling and connecting and and being in tune with energy rather than procedural, rigid, doctrinal thinking. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you have this interaction between your sensitivity with acupuncture needle and the observation of the energy flow of the client that you're working with. And also we check the pulse diagnosis. There's this this awakening of your sensibility to energy qualities that opened a whole dimension of possibilities for me and like perceiving how health actually is, that it's not just a bunch of lab tests or we studied that too. But the, this experiential part of honing your energy awareness, it got me thinking, this is a whole dimension of our human health and physiology. You know, with my education work, I often talk about this idea of intelligence, like What does it mean to be intelligent? Our old world limited us to think that it's just your IQ. That's why in this community of health seekers and truth seekers, that's part of the distortion too. We have information overload. We think that we're so smart if we've done more research than the next person. But the true human is balanced in terms of physical, mental, emotional, spiritual planes. And we're aware of um, IQ and EQ, but what about energy awareness, energy sensitivity? What about intuitive awareness, intuitive abilities? What about your spiritual intelligence and how your spiritual principles is embodied and expressed in day-to-day practical actions of your life? That's actually true intelligence. All of those dimensions, in fact, are the true intelligence. They duped us into thinking, over-focusing on mental intellect activities, and it's not embodied, so it's not authentic, it's not honest. So in Chinese medicine school, that was one of the big things that got started getting recalibrated in my system that came into a kind of new balance point. It was like, oh, sensitivity to energies and Qigong class, and Tai Chi class. And most of our teachers also had a Qigong and Tai Chi practice. So they had a presence in just how they moved in front of the blackboard even, mm-hmm. right? That that had an energy quality that shifted my being. Wow. So Qigong, for sure, my number one favorite class. And now in hindsight, as I remembered more of my past lives and so on, I realized that, yeah, I was supposed to quickly reawaken some dormant memories 
by doing the Qigong practices. And so in 2003, I was probably, I think, like two thirds of the way done with Chinese medicine training at this point. I love the Qigong practice so much that I studied extra with the teacher who taught the Qigong classes in school, oh. also apprenticed with a Qigong healer outside of school. I just immersed myself, like, yum, 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 soaked up as much of this did, as did possible. Did you remember that time when you were a four year old at, at this point? Yeah, so the whole four-year-old story was kind of reawakened in me when I was in my software job. I was like, I hate this job. <laughs> I am really good at I won the Employee of the Year Award. I was getting promoted and all of this. I was just like, why am I sick and fat and inflamed? I had digestion problems. I had debilitating menstrual cramps every month. I had headaches and migraines. Mm. I had bad skin. I, I was about 15 pounds more inflamed than I am now. Hey, so what's going on? I'm working out, you know, I don't overeat. Like, why am I so inflamed? And in hindsight, I realized this because I really was not happy with my career choice. I mm. just happened to be quite good at it. So the world keeps saying, like, keep doing it. You're so good. You're so good. But when you're not, not walking your soul's path, your physicality will tell you that at some point. Mm. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, it was a certain moment in which I remembered, you know, at age four, I always wanted to be a Chinese healer. What happened? Whose yeah. life am I living? And, so, and then so you're in, you're in Chinese medicine school. And so, right. By 2003, yeah. I'm in Chinese medicine school about two thirds of the way into it at this point. Um, and so I'm studying with this Chinese um, Qigong teacher who taught in our school, but she has some more advanced classes outside of school. So, and then I was also apprenticing with a Qigong healer and a traditional, like old style Chinese bone setter who did wow. old style Chinese bone setting, like the, the precursor to chiropractic, basically. So I learned all these very like lineage based manual therapy techniques and I would work on elite high performance athletes using the skills. So I had this whole amazing, like rich life of exploring all these things. So in 2003, I'm studying Qigong, and I just noticed that every time I practice Qigong, for those of you guys that are new to the idea of Qigong, is basically the Chinese medicine version of a meditative yogic type practice. So Qigong is defined simply by whenever you practice and you're conscious of your intention and where your mind goes, they say where your mind goes, your chi follows. So there's some uh, intentionality with your mind, with your intention, and then with the breath, and then with your physical body posture, whether it's seated in a certain way, holding your hands up or down or with mudras, or there's some movement involved that channels the flow of the energy. Whenever you have these combinations of things going on, that's qigong. So you could do qigong dishwashing, you could do you know, Qigong gardening is just about breath work and intention and being aware and sensitive to energies in whatever you're doing. So you know, you, re did, real quick on that, you, I took a class with you three years ago, almost, I can't believe it's almost three years ago now. And I remember what you just talked about with respect to where you're, what I call it is where you focus your awareness like consciousness is all things, but your point of awareness, you become that quite literally, right? And what I found when I first learned Qigong from you is that as we're focusing on different um, energy centers, they're called diantans, right? That's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. yeah. Different diantans. When we come back to our head, you have this, or at least I did this realization that, oh my goodness, when I was focusing my awareness on my chest, on my stomach, back on my chest and on my head, I, my con my awareness was not there. I was somewhere else. And you don't realize that till you come back to your head. That was yeah. so profound for me because it's like, wow, I am not in my mind. I am wherever I focus my awareness. Super trippy stuff. Most people, if, if there's one really important skill is people say, I don't know how to turn, turn my mind off. Like who, well, whose life are you living? Mm -hmm. Whose mind is this? Why is that not part of our upbringing? Why don't we use our mind when it's useful and take a break, man, rest, mm -hmm. rest your mind, relax. We don't know how to relax. 
we don't know how to slow our thoughts down or reattune our thoughts to a different channel based on what is appropriate and practical and useful for the situation. There are times when you're doing bookkeeping in Excel spreadsheet, turn it on, man. You need that. When you're done, gear it down. Go play with your kids. Jump on the trampoline. Go play some music. Go enjoy life. Drop back into the joyful state when it's time to drop deeper into restful relaxation. That's a skill that is really unfortunate that is not everybody has that skill. It's just like, you know, you have a hand, you know how to, you know, cut vegetables and make food with it and to hug your children and your spouse and like, it's a rich and beautiful part of the experience, but we don't know how to reattune our energy systems. And we're missing out on so much beauty and possibility in this life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, back to the 2003, that was the beginning of me reawakening this possibility that through, I had tried meditative techniques for so long, but, you know, living in Northern California, there was like, was like a candy shop of like every possible meditative technique and every possible style that I could try classes but none of it you know for whatever reason for me when I started studying qigong combining the conscious awareness with the breath and with the physical postures and it really worked for me so every time I practiced qigong it was always a win I always felt more Um, at peace and more centered I could drop in and get some intuitive guidance get greater clarity about life and you know just rest my mind from the busy monkey mind state by focusing on the breath I didn't have to consciously try to be like don't think don't think don't think like that never works how focus on the deep breathing focus on slowing down the breath focus on your breath pattern and drop into your heart and drop into your belly anchor into the earth you know and then naturally your mind relaxes and you feel rooted and centered and grounded and in peace and content within Mm -hmm. yourself again it doesn't have to be complicated so it's always a win when you do simple practices like that but this particular day in 2003 for whatever reason maybe planetary alignments or something um This teacher was guiding us into this beautiful meditation and was having a wonderful experience of it. And I dropped deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then everything exploded into trillions of trillions of pieces of love and light. And I experienced myself as the size of the entire cosmos. And there was no more physical body. There was no like time, no space. It was this intense, almost unbearable, but totally comfortable sense of bliss and contentment. And going into that meditation, I was holding a question. And that question and millions of other questions all got instantly answered. so yeah the best I used to say I experienced myself as just pure love and pure light but contentment is really an accurate description like profound contentment there was no concept of times I'm not sure how long this lasted But eventually, from a far, far away distance, there was this meditation teacher's voice. And there was this, like, what's going on? Wait a minute. There's a Qigong class going on in San Francisco. And there's a girl named Edith sitting in a chair over there. Maybe maybe this this it should go back to that it. So it's completely impersonal. You're, like, disconnected from the, the ego, so to speak. You know, I have such a hard time with these words. Yeah. And I think I, I I trust your audience can feel behind the words because all these words are not really accurate for, I, I don't know, words are just words. Yeah. Um, 
there was just an experience of being completely beyond time and space, beyond the physical, and then some kind of call to go back into the physical. Hmm. So it's like, hmm, maybe, maybe it or we or something should go back to that Edith's body. Um, these pronouns, it's just <laughs> these days with pronouns being such a funny thing. I'm I like, know, I love I, <laughs> and by the way, Kuan Yin, who I have such a deep connection with, I, I wear this pendant of Kuan Yin everywhere. And um, Kuan Yin is said to have transcended all male and female possibilities and sometimes appears at male, and, you know, because they at this stage, like you can express its consciousness can express in various forms, right? Anyway, so so from that vantage point, when people like laugh about things like all the things that humans argue about is pretty hilarious. You yeah. know, it's just like, it, is it an it or is it a he or a she or we or a they? Who cares? You know, yeah. it's like we're in the infinite oneness and we are also now going to densify back into the physical form. Mm-hmm. Well, in that time, in 2003, I hadn't read any spiritual books. I was new on my journey of Chinese medicine. and so. Nobody had prepared me for what was going to happen. The absolute absurdity of taking infinite pieces of love and light the size of the cosmos and squeezing it back into this pretense of a physical body. It felt so ridiculous and absurd. Claustrophobic? It was almost, almost like a painful experience. And so when it finally landed, there was just this avalanches of tears and it took me a long time to to kind of go back and like what was all the clashing of so many sensations and emotions in that moment and the best i can articulate is this this intense and indescribable love and appreciation and gratitude for having gone home because i realized that this is home this is our natural state this is who we all are on the deepest levels is the pure love, pure wholeness, pure completeness. And also this like really intense anger and grief and sadness landing in the physical body, realizing that how this place is made is entirely backwards and upside down. And it was an instant knowing the moment that it landed back into the physical. So the clashing of intense love and appreciation and intense um anger and sadness was turned me into a seeker it was so unbearably uncomfortable to have that tension within my being and of course I was a highly functional human being I got good grades in school I went to Ivy League college I was in grad school I had part-time jobs I had internships I just I went everywhere got the stuff done you know showed up um, was professional and everything that I did, but inside I was in this intense turmoil. And I didn't even know terms like dark night of the soul. And when people would ask me, Edith, how are you doing? I might just pretend and say, I'm fine. But if I had a moment and people really wanted me to be honest, it would be like, I, I'm not fine, actually. I'm so intensely homesick. Hmm. People are like, what do you mean homesick? You want to go to Chinatown and eat some Chinese food? <laughs> like, I'm like, no, 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 not for home, <laughs> like Hong Kong, where I grew up. Home, home. Mm-hmm. So I would do meditations to escape the intensity of how dense this place is. And I would have these blissful experiences. But then I still have to come back to this body and like do stuff. And, and so it turned me into a seeker. And a lot of what became now super wellness is the integration of these many different dimensions and all the facets of my journey distilled into um, what I wish somebody could have supported me with and held me with. After an intense spiritual awakening experience, There is that's just the beginning, actually. Now, how are you going to integrate it and be rooted, centered, grounded, and express this loving state in the practical day-to-day dimensions of life. There's a lot of skillfulness that's involved in that now. 
you know, so it turned me into a seeker traveling around the world, lots of retreats, lots of meditation experiences, lots of inquiry, lots of soul searching and studying with different people with supernatural abilities. And then seeing that they all had something beautiful to offer, some things that I resonated with and things that I didn't resonate with. But the good news is that I feel so so appreciative of having had that as a reference point as my truth meter. What is closer to this love and compassion and kindness, this sensation of truth that I experience, that I can't put words to, but I can I can see it, I can feel it when I see it yeah. and feel it. So it calibrated my inner compass, be like, what's closer to that and what's further from that? And that became my guiding principle for everything that I've done in my life ever since. Was that a continual like cultivation process or was that sort of instantaneous after that experience? The truth meter. It was in is both because it's instantaneous, but how does it get applied into your life? Mm. It's not always that simple, yeah. right? Like, you know, what is the right answer, but then how can you express things, your truth with other people that may or may not have the same um, awareness of the spiritual dimension as you. How do you express it in a way that is grounded and practical and sensible based on their level of consciousness? This is why I ended up studying Dr. David Hawkins's many levels of consciousness. He's got this wonderful map of consciousness that really helped me to, to have a framework of, you know, like how can I, how can I meet everybody wherever they are? And how can I meet myself where I am to clean up all these different residues of my own shadows, my own darkness and clean up my past and make amends. And, you know, that's really a lifelong journey. Maybe many lifetimes. Some of us are here to break, you know, long-term lineage patterns. And I know that's the type of people that, that tunes into your, my work. So it's, it's, beyond profound what we're doing in this lifetime to integrate all these dimensions, to bring the spiritual awakening experience into a grounded, practical sense of life. This is it, the, the grounded, practical sense. Because So what, what's coming up for me as you are describing this journey that you had of, of going back home and coming here and then sort of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but becoming this like obsessive seeker based on like, how can I take what I know now and have experienced up there, out there, wherever that was, and knowing that that is who we are integrated here. So then you began seeking. And so in the seeking process, I'd imagine that there was a lot of externalizing at first, right? Like, like, like looking for answers out there. And I, I guess my question is at what point along the journey did it become outside in and turn into no it's 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 inside and i express that out um i don't have like a moment in which that happened mm -hmm. you know it was like layers and layers of that but i would like to give two people my deepest thanks for it one is byron katie because mm -hmm. That gave me a tool where in the heat of the moment, in a stressful situation, I could feel that the, why am I so stressed out and upset about this situation? She gave me a framework, like, what am I believing about this situation that is not in harmony with my deepest truth? Mm -hmm. That's why I feel stressful. So that stress meter becomes like, she calls it a temple bell, like ding, 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 ding. You might be believing something in this situation that's not in alignment with your deepest inner truth. On some level, nothing is truth. This whole reality is an illusion. That's but, right. Is it true in self-inquiry process, right? Yeah, she has this inquiry practice. Is it true? Can I absolutely know that this is true? How do I behave and what happens when I believe this thought in yeah. this particular situation? So it's not abstract. It's like in this exact situation, my belief about this is causing stress for myself and others, probably. Who would I be in the same situation without that stressful thought and belief? 
And then she has you look at different, uh, she calls it opposites, you know, so flip it around, see if it's also true. And the flipping around is where you bring it back to personal responsibility. So these are just like theories. It was doing thousands of worksheets on very specific one-off situations in practical everyday life that helped me integrate. Mm-hmm. Like you got to do that work, you know? And so that's why they say before enlightenment chop would carry water, after enlightenment chop would carry water. And and the juice for me was the, the chop would carry water, but with a different lens of looking at how can I bring what I know is my true deepest nature, which is love and kindness. You know, how how can I express that authentically here? Well, especially that- when, when when we're faced with what we've been faced with for the last three years, because I think that's like, you know, you and I have talked about that quite a bit, the the balance or the the line between embodying kindness and compassion in all that we do while knowing that there are those who wish to impose and infringe upon us and perpetrate and push all this stuff on us. Like where, how do we, how do we take those two positions together? Yeah. So this is where it's like coming back to personal responsibility because uh, love is not like an, a bystander in atrocities, you know? So that's where there's deep soul searching involved. Like what is the most loving thing for me to express in this really strange and messed up situation? It's not easy. You know, that's why Byron Katie calls her thing, the work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not like if it was so easy, she, she wouldn't call it the work mm-hmm. because You know, when you're already in the state of flowing with kindness and love, you're just enjoying playing music, playing with your children, having a good time. You don't need to do worksheets in that moment. (laughs) You know, it's these these situations that it's like, oh, something feels not good about this. Let me give myself loving space to just like get get clarity. What is the what is the appropriate thing that is in authenticity within myself? So it took thousands of these kinds of little small situations for me to practice. And that actually calibrated my circuitry to be able to hold more of that state of love and kindness and goodness that I was experiencing in 2003. And I started experiencing a lot of just ongoing kind of bliss Mm -hmm. and the Qigong practice also. So I was able to, whoa. I can be in that state and in my body at the same time. Mm -hmm. But it took time for this physical vessel to calibrate to those frequencies of possibilities. And so there was a lot of things, uh, uh, eating eating, um, a high vibe diet and drinking the right kind of water and spending time in nature and sunshine. And then the second big thing was going to darkroom retreat where I went really deep and recalibrated a lot of things integrated for me in those days in complete darkness. Can you share about that experience a little bit? Yeah, there's, I mean, we could talk the whole time just about darkroom, you know, but in, it's interesting, it's all these 10 year cycles for some reason. So the first Qigong experience happened in 2003. So it was in 2013, I felt drawn to go to Jasmine Heen's darkroom retreat, who you've also had on your show. She's a dear friend. I consider her a mentor. I consider her a kind of bodhisattva in this world like holding a way she's so far out you know like she's she in the 90s she awakened the possibility to be completely she calls this source fed and you know she'll eat like a little bit of fruits here and there with her grandchildren but she can go for for prolonged periods not eating and not recommending this for people by the way just saying that these there are beings on the planet that are at this state of being um And she happens to, um, you know, I don't care so much about the eating, not eating, but but what she shares about a state of being and a a beautiful loving energy that she emanates really resonated for me. So in 2013, I felt drawn to try out her darkness retreat in Thailand, where she rents out this building from Mantak Chia um, at the Tao Gardens, and she hosts her own retreat. Manhug Chia also has his different style of retreat, and she brought a different kind of energy that I really resonated with. 
And so it was 11 days with nine days and nine nights in complete darkness. And yeah, many different memories came back about my different lifetimes. And um, there was multidimensional travel and beings and just a deep reconnection with myself as a vast and multidimensional being, which is what we all are, you know, so many aspects. I particularly regain conscious memories of many aspects of a life as a old Qigong master, which partially explains why in this life, pretty early in my path, I was drawn to Qigong in those like key moments at age four and, you know, in my early twenties. Breadcrumbs for then later on. Yeah. 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 And, and I was sharing, you know, before we started hitting record that just, um, um, feeling really moved on a soul level that in this lifetime, that there are, um, there's infinite lives. And in this particular lifetime, the theme for many of us is to take our spiritual memories and integrate it in a practical day-to-day human experience you know, while running a business, while raising children, while tending our gardens and so on. Um, Not to be a hermit in the mountains meditating for decades at a time, which I regain conscious memory of what that experience was like for me also. Yeah, so there was a lot of um, beautiful things that integrated different um, uh, beings that visited that I had some cosmic powwow and, you know, conference meetings and uh, exchange of uh, knowledge and downloads and uploads probably beyond the scope of this conversation. But ultimately, after nine days and nine nights in complete darkness, there was a number of things that I realized, like, very quickly within the first three days, I realized that as a city dweller, I never knew what complete darkness was like, because there's always an LED light, a street glare and all of this stuff. And I realized that darkness is a kind of food that my system was so hungry for. The first two or three days, even though I was very well slept, not sleep deprived, I still slept deeply, deeply like I had never slept before. It was so nourishing. And I could feel my cells going, (laughs) just eating up a kind of food that it was hungry for. Hmm. And I often use the analogy, like, let's say you lived in polluted cities all your life. And for the first time ever, somebody took you into a rainforest or took you into a redwood forest. And there was like, whoo, the chi, the prana, the, the effervescent juiciness of each and every breath. You've never experienced that before. You don't even know that you're missing out and that your cells are really hungry for it. So I experienced that with the darkness which later informed in super wellness why the complete darkness at night is so critical. It's a juice, it's a food that our cells need, which then awakens spiritual possibilities on a cellular level and on a consciousness level in your nervous system, but it's every cell of your being because you have photoreceptors on your skin too. I could see, sense, feel, and know every cell of my being was recalibrating in the presence of that complete darkness. There was a kind of juice and food that was like, oh, so good. And when I finally came out of the dark room after nine days and nine nights, a deep appreciation of light. So when you come out, the way that Jasmine organizes hers is um, at sunset. So the light is not too bright and you put on uh, sunglasses and as you walk out and you let your eyes start to adjust, when you're ready, take off your sunglasses and you look at every leaf, every flower, and you look at that sunset and it's this indescribable experience of all the multidimensional geometries and depths and perception of the beauty of creation that is in every leaf and every flower and in your hand and the colors that you've never seen before. And it's not just like a psychedelic trip. It was like a realization that this beauty is always here available. We just 
don't have the eyes to see it. It was this like, oh, we've been missing out. This human life is so rich and so beautiful. And what we're doing in this reality system, we're missing out, man. Let's not miss out anymore. There's a, a depth of beauty and richness that is possible. And it's not anything complicated. I didn't, I just sat in the freaking dark cave for nine days and nine nights, right? And I didn't, I didn't. I didn't eat. I just drank a little water. And it was just, it was the most blissful, beautiful, rich, rich in all the dimensions of that word. Like all my senses were enriched by that experience of sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> you know, this, this is, this was going to be my next question. Actually, it's really interesting that you bring this up, this simplicity of it, right? Doing something so simple because in all your years of integrating, um, do it like going through the dark night of the soul, trying to integrate what you knew and then seeking and going down all these paths, you came to the understanding that in order to awaken these so-called supernatural, and they are so-called supernatural abilities because they're abilities that lie dormant in each and every one of us, I firmly believe, um, mm -hmm. requires that we just come back to simplicity. Simplicity. Like for me, just to, just to give a little anecdote, I just got done with a 15-day water fast. I felt more connected spiritually, more connected with myself, more connected with the creator, more connected with my environment than I ever have doing any, you know, practice that I was taught. Qigong helped in the morning, but just doing that, very simple thing of just drinking water and experiencing emptiness inside my body, which also led to me emptying out some unprocessed things that I, that I, some of which I didn't even know were still there. You know, I'm talking about like mental, emotional, spiritual things. And mm -hmm. I felt so unbelievably connected to myself. And I felt myself awakening some of those dormant abilities, those extra senses. I could really tune in like really tune into the emotions of people around me by mm -hmm. day 12, 13, 14, 15, um, just by being around them just instantaneously and just felt so in love with life, just life, just very simple things. And I felt so alive just drinking water for 15 days. That's it. <laughs> Something simple like that. Yeah. Yeah. You look amazing, by the way. Thank I was you. wondering if we, at some point in this conversation, this is the first <laughs> first time people have seen yeah. you on camera since your big. Uh, I wanted to your big upgrade. Yeah, you know? yeah thanks. This is yeah. A, yeah, it's nice to meet the fresh new Alec. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I feel so calm in my nervous system. Yeah, that's like one of the main things. Um, just feel so connected to myself in a very deep way. It's it's amazing, but. Yeah. So, so it's, it's simple. It's, it's so simple. And that's like sort of what led you to, to write super wellness and then to do what you do. Well, there's a bit more. So after I came back from dark room, um, it really helped because just like you, my senses were awakened and heightened. And so mm -hmm. it was very helpful clinically. I could see, sense, and feel and know deeper levels of what's going on with people's health. Mm -hmm. And so I could get much better clinical results by not basically like beating around the bush, like zero in on what was actually helpful to each and every client that walked into my clinic. But at night, it was hard to rest because I hadn't gained the skillfulness of how to turn um, off some of that sensibility. And I've since really cultivated the different Qigong practices to cocoon myself in a certain energy bubble and then to expand and make it more open when when appropriate and to tighten it so that I can be in crowded cities with many mixed energies and not throw myself off my center. You know, that's a whole level of skillfulness that I realize is really important for the spiritual awakening journey is that part of the integration if you're gonna be surrounded by people in the city or family members or whatever. There's some, there's an energetic and spiritual skill toolkits that is helpful there. Um, yeah. So 
So I ended up moving to um, the countryside and many people know the story of how that's when my um, now eight and a half year old boy started visiting and saying, hey, I know you guys aren't planning to have kids, but I'm ready. Let's go. And so, you know, he taught me many things. Don't, don't that- jump over that, though, because <laughs> that like, <laughs> sorry, it's in my throat. Without the proper context. That like. Hold on, let me get this out of my throat. Edit this out if you see this card. Hold on. Okay, that's better now. Okay, don't don't jump over that though, because when you say that your son was visiting you, people could hear that and be like, "Wait, what?" Like when you say that, explain what you mean by son was visiting you. Okay. Well, how many hours do we got with this? <laughs> yeah, I know. That, I didn't want to get like, but like we can't. I. It's funny because I had this like this. Um, this could be three hours, but I don't want it to be because I know we have we have a tight time window. But <laughs> as as briefly as you can, when you say your son was visiting you, what do you mean by that? Okay, so we moved to the countryside because I needed some time to integrate and recalibrate after the big experience of the dark room. You know, I was simultaneously feeling a lot more integrated, but also so heightened in my sensitivities that that I needed some time to just be in the countryside, be immersed in nature and not living in the city. And so as soon as I did that, many different interesting things started to stabilize, like my circadian rhythm for the first time in my life, like bright and energized with the sunrise, no need for alarm and naturally like chilling out and wanting to be sleepy without really like trying to, you know, discipline myself to go to sleep. And then my dreams were very vivid and heightened and I'd get this deep restful state and I would remember my dreams and be refreshed and ready to meet the exciting, glorious new day. That consistent rhythm of that was new to me because I lived in cities all my life. So just the appreciation of the day and night cycles of natural full spectrum light during the day, complete darkness, and then now adding grounding as an everyday lived experience, not trying to go to the go to the park to go barefoot on bare earth or use the grounding mats or sheets plugged into the third prong of my outlet, like real grounding by barefoot on bare earth on the acre of land that I was actually living on every single day was such a deep recalibration in my system. And it helped me to maintain that spiritual connection as a lived everyday experience, not glitches of it, but actually it was just, oh, what is it like to be a spiritually connected human being during the day and during the night? And so in my dream time and in my meditations, insights came a lot faster and beings would kind of send messages. I, this might feel sound weird to some people, but it just was normal. And I, I knew I wasn't going crazy because I was still showing up, paying bills, going to work. And, <laughs> you know, like I was like a grounded, level-headed human being. So I'm pretty sure I wasn't going crazy. And then this little baby started visiting night after night after night and saying, I know you you guys weren't planning to have children, but but I've been watching you for a long time. You're ready. This is the time. And I'm ready. This is the time for me to come in. And so he started just training me, basically, showing me things about what is to be unfolding in the future changes of mankind and how he wanted to participate in that and how every soul scours the cosmos to choose their perfect set of families incarnate into there was this one night in which he showed me this beautiful scene I was in this half half wake half dream state and I was like Dave babe Dave is here you know he's like la, 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 I don't want to hear it I'm not ready for children and and he showed me this beautiful scene it was this ocean this orbs of light all connected by strings and strands of light And it was all these baby spirits that had chosen to come to earth around this time. And he said, you see all of us, we've each scoured the cosmos and decided that we want to come to earth to participate in this grand change in consciousness that is happening. And each of us have scoured the whole planet to find the perfect timing, the perfect families, the perfect communities for our individual journey 
and also for our collective journey. So the mathematic calculations and permutations involved is way too intricate for me to show to you properly. But just so you know that it's the perfection of this is indescribable to your consciousness as a physical being right now. You have to take my word for it. And it's a free will universe. So know that if you choose not to participate in this, he went and he disappeared the whole scene. He said, we'll have to go back to the drawing board and figure out the next best permutation because it's all intricately tied together. So no pressure or anything. Just so you know, you're not choosing a nuclear family unit. You're choosing to participate in this entire ocean, this web work of new possibilities. And he said, the reason that you are so hesitant about family and parenthood and education, all the things that you feel like didn't work for you, is true. That's why you're the perfect parents for us. <laughs> you know, so everybody that's listening out there, if, you know, just trust that your children chose you in particular because they their upbringing requires your unique sets of gifts and perspectives and you know that perfect blend of rebel energy that you have uh, is all this participating in the building of the new paradigm and he was very clear pre-incarnation that he's coming here to build a new way of doing human mm -hmm. or you know, I, I I think we have mixed feelings about the word human, but you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, I get um, it. Yeah, so so he says everything that you don't like about the old paradigm is true. You're right, and it has nothing to do with us. We're here to show a new possibility. Oh. And, and so now he's eight and a half, and he's the reason that I've spent most of my work on revamping not just health but education mm -hmm. and the whole conversation about family life and and parenthood and all of that because these are all the new ways of being human that is arising and birthing through all of mm -hmm. us right now but i think the first order of business the super wellness work is so important because let's start by coming home to ourselves and taking good care of our physical vessel Right. Without this, nothing else is going to work properly. Mm -hmm. So what's the order of operations? All of us need to have a basic ability to attune within ourselves, take beautiful care of our health and be integrated in our physiology and then hold this state while we are doing parenting, running our business and all of that. You know, this is like a big operating system upgrade for humankind. And, and this is what I mean. It's like all this knowledge and wisdom that you've cultivated over the years, you've you've come to understand that it, in order to awaken our consciousness and awaken these gifts within us, it starts with coming back to very, very simple, easy to implement practical solutions in our day-to-day -day lives with respect to health. And health is not just the physical piece, this is what I was trying to touch on at the very beginning that I articulated very poorly, but health is not just the physical piece, it's the mental and spiritual. Like it has to be a conversation about all three of the things. And I think that, you know, at least much how I felt over the last 12 to 18 months is I've been so here. And for those that are listening, like I'm pointing to my head right now, I've been so here, so analytical, so mental, almost like mental masturbation of like trying to figure out the data and like virus isolation stuff. And it's like, I have, I won't say lost the heart. I won't say I've lost the connection to the creator and to source, but it's that because I've been so focused on this, I'm forgetting that those are aspects of health that are almost more fundamental and are, are more important to our total well-being than trying to figure out the data and all this stuff that I've been sharing, you know? And I, I, I feel like it's time for all of us to come back home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit like we're, you know, we all have like, if, if people like cars, I don't know, if people like Lambos or like Ferraris or whatever, it's yeah. like the super high performance car and you only ever learn how to drive it on one gear. Yeah. You know, yeah. 
because of our schooling and education and our bringing and just the old beliefs and old stories that I'm glad that, I mean, as a grand experiment, we came here to see like, what does the story of separation lead? And what does the physical materialist paradigm lead to? What does the pure intellectual pursuit separated from our hearts and our souls, like what does that create? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've learned from that. If you're like me and you feel like you've outgrown that paradigm, that you feel like you deserve a more rich and vast and beautiful experience of life, come on over, yeah. try this new paradigm, you know? And so it it it's so deep, it's so profound, and it meets everybody wherever they are. Because if you just want to start with like, oh, okay, I want to cultivate some inner awareness. Um, so let's talk about the H E A L T H. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the the six dimensions of super wellness we have a you know fun acronym a little cheesy H E A L T H is easy to remember the first H is coming home to ourselves so depending on where people are at their journey it could start with just okay check in with yourself this is your life this is your body this is your health what works for you and what doesn't work for you? You already know the answers. Let's be become the boss and back in the driving seat of our lives again. Many people will resonate with that and we'll start with, okay, if I'm hungry, eat. If I'm full, stop eating. If I'm thirsty, drink some water. You know, if I'm tired, go take a rest. Maybe you need a nap. If your body feels stiff and cranky, go move it, go dance, go exercise. Let's start with that. 99% of the people out there don't even have this level of command of their own physiology just to listen to, okay, simple, simple things like this. Like many people, myself included, I've been there, not in touch with my own thirst or hunger or that kind of thing even, right? So it's actually a pretty profound thing to start there. But how deep can it go? For example, with you having this experience of the, the water fast, you realize that it's a recalibration of all of your senses. And then that this, this awareness can go really deep. It opens the possibility of unfolding into a deeper inquiry of who you really are on the deepest levels and the, the memories of our past and the emotions. It can go as deep as you want to go. And I'm reminded of um, my good friend, Wim Hof. Um, he, he, he's, he did the forward for super wellness and he was, on my podcast a few years ago. And he was like, you know, people think there are five senses, but there are at least eight senses. So sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, people call those the five senses. But what about the intuitive sense? Intuition, people call the sixth sense, but it's really the first sense. Mm -hmm. And even with intuition, you can kind of like break it down into people get intuitive information in many different ways you know, clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient. And um, if you've looked into human design, the way that people know, there's different types of knowing. Some people just know it with like a gut feeling, you know. Some people know it in different ways. They have to like feel a flow of emotions and listen for that, right? So it's about knowing how we get this kind of intuitive information too, in terms of coming home to ourselves, getting to know how this works. And in some ways, this is very esoteric, but in some ways, this is very fundamental to our human experience of knowing ourselves and coming home to ourselves to understand how we, how we know our inner compass and our inner truth. How does that work? And Wim says, you know, there's also proprioception and interoception. So interoception is a, a term they call with, you know, really tuning into your inner awareness. And if you really know, like there's a lot of people like Wim and some different um, spiritual teachers who and yogis and Qigong masters who in lab situations are able to show that they can consciously change their physiological markers turn down inflammatory markers mm -hmm. and, and slow down their heart rates and change their brain states, all of this. 
But everyone can experience that when you start practicing a little breath work and Qigong, you already know that that possibility yeah. <laughs> is alive in everybody. It's just yeah. the degrees of are you yellow belt, orange belt or black belt with that <laughs> yeah. skill, right? Yeah. So that's coming home to ourselves as a calibration and awakening of these possibilities within ourselves. But here's a really profound thing. He says, what is true proprioception? So proprioception is the ability to sense where we're in, you know, balance and time and space. An athlete needs really good proprioceptive senses. But I was asking him, like, you do all these daredevil things that other people would just say is completely dangerous and crazy. And it is for most people. Most of what he does, they they shouldn't do. Like, don't. So, so a lot of these superhuman possibilities we talk about is like, don't try this at home. You got to know yourself to know where you're on your journey. What is the right next level of expansion that is that is appropriate based on your phase of the journey, right? This is not about going zero to hero and, you know, trying to prove ourselves or something. But with proprioception, this blew my mind. He said, you know, true proprioception is tuning into our timeless eternal self beyond time and space and anchoring that into this aspect of ourselves that is in time and space. That's beautiful. And I meditate on this a lot. You know, a lot of times people in our community say, talk about words like freedom and awakening. Oh, they're so awake and all this stuff. These words have almost lost their meaning. Yeah. It's too bad. Yeah. You know, because what is awakening? Really hard to describe it. If I were to try to describe it, my own journey is... You can say in 2003, I had a spontaneous awakening experience, but I didn't feel awake most of the time after that. I'd have these temporary glimpses back into that state. But when I actually feel awake is when I'm in my body, present, aware of the physical dimension of life, while also aware of my infinite eternal self at the same time. The integration of my timeless eternal self with my time-bound physical time-space reality here, centered, grounded, rooted, embodied within myself. That's when I feel that I'm awake. Mm -hmm. How many people in the, quote, awake community is approaching our interactions with one another from this state? can do better let's do better yeah because it's such when i can look at alec i simultaneously see he's a cool dude he's a dad he runs a podcast you know he's a husband he's a friend i see all those aspects of him i see his nice haircut i see all the physical aspects and i see a heart to heart soul to soul connection and imagine a world where we can relate on all these dimensions with each other. Mm. What a beautiful way of doing life. I think a lot of people in this community forget that, which is, again, why I said it's time to come back home to this deeper understanding of what health looks like. Yeah, what does it look like? If our friends and our family who aren't necessarily like-minded about issues of politics or medical freedom and so on, what possibilities could awaken if they just feel this quality of beingness that helps them to awaken a remembering on a deeper soul level, which just psh, the whole, the whole house of cards of all these pretenses just drop away and we can be authentically relating with each other again those so-called evil doers out there have no chance at this game mm. they don't even right and then we can have compassion that they've so lost their way as souls you know but let us 
focus on ourselves first, return to wholeness within ourselves, and then ripple this quality of beingness, this energy into our families, into our communities mm -hmm. first. And then the rest just takes care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like really powerful medicine for a lot of people right now. You know, I, I don't want to say people are stuck in the like so-called truth or community, but I feel like there is like muckiness that is that is sticky that people are sort of sitting in, and we all have the ability to step out of it. It 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 requires this 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 deeper embodiment of of what it means to be well what it means to be super well you know for lack of a better term like because yeah. i always think of like if if we're operating under the presupposition which may be a totally inaccurate one that there's that there's not that many people who are awake to what's going on okay let's let's play with that for a second we we're in need of waking other people up let's play with that for a second too which which they are presuppositions but that's the case if we're if we're actually embodying a more attractive way of being we are much more likely to convert people to our way of being rather than embodying the same nastiness that we point out for coming from you know the mainstream perspective yeah in a, a way no -brainer. it's Right. How well was the, the this this protesty, angsty blame game energy? How well is that working for us? Not it's not no. working too well, you know. No. So maybe try a different way. Yeah. At the end of the day, what helps you to come into peace and harmony within yourself? Yeah. You know, take care of your own business first. Yeah. Take beautiful care of your energy systems and emanate this into the world and allow magic to unfold around you, you know? So I was recently at an event and I had a talk with a guy who was not really finger quotes awake to the different agendas at play. And, um, and we got into a conversation and he suddenly just opened up and, and other people observing it. They're like, how did you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I think I should just sit and contemplate and reverse engineer it. And it was like I had connected with this guy on a heart to heart, soul to soul level. Like I just knew he was a good dude through and through on the deepest levels. But nobody, he was like, oh, those anti vaxxers and all that, blah, blah, blah. He was using all those labels. I was like, oh, huh. But here he is with this wonderful rapport with me, but he's judging all these people who are, you know, um, as, you know, conspiracy or whatever. And um, I just kind of shared with him my honest, sincere, authentic journey of my own path of exploring and researching. And yeah, you know, without any energy of pushiness and co coercion. And he was like, wow 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 and then he was like thank you thank you and he was like oh my god and he kind of like did his head I was like breathe brother breathe it's okay take your time you don't need to like you know you you don't need to wake up to all the agendas it's a lot just let maybe we should stop it here yeah. and we start joking and hugging and high-fiving and you know this is how we can build um return to oneness as as a mm. mankind through love through kindness through mutual respect if we want mutual respect out in the world, we have to get consistent in practicing that within our inner circles, you know? Yeah. Yeah. One thing that always sticks with me is, uh, I always put this in the back of my mind. I share this pretty often. Had I not experienced what I experienced seeing both my wife and my mom drastically heal from their issues and then going down the rabbit hole myself, would I be able to see through what's gone on. I mean, this is military grade propaganda that's been wielded at us for three and a half years and beyond. And I don't know that the answer is yes. I would hope that I'd be able to see through what's going on, but because I don't know whether I would be able to or not, I remember that 
And that helps me to have compassion and understanding for people who can't see through what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really good for us to be sober to the fact that there was military grade propaganda going on. So the solution is not bombarding our friends and family with more, you know, data points. Mm -hmm. The solution is their nervous system is so overloaded, so frazzled, so discombobulated, so confused. No, they they just need love and kindness yeah. first. Yep. They, they need a delicious, lovingly cooked meal and, you know, some time in nature and, yeah, a, a way to recalibrate their nervous systems and their physiology so that they can even begin to open to looking at nuanced levels of information. So the new human is multidimensional. We're healthy and vibrant on all levels, body, mind, emotion, soul. We have physical, mental, emotional, spiritual intelligences awakened within us. We're sensitive to energies, right? We're well-rounded and integrated in all these dimensions. Well, that's actually, there's a lot that contributes to this well-rounded wholeness and integration and well-being on all the levels including sunshine during the day, sleep in darkness, um, a relationship with our water, a deep study of how hydration really works on a cellular level, how to work with the waters of our body, a breathing practice so we can tap into these deeper states of inner and outer awareness, a mindful awareness of our eating, not just what we eat, but how we eat, right? These are really simple things. I'm sure you've heard about all of this, but this can be very advanced and very profound practice. It's all and about so stacking functions too, though, like, like doing all of them at the same time. And now you're kind of talking about the other letters of that uh, six-part acronym of, uh, acronym of health. Um, which I don't think we have time to get into all of them because we can continue this conversation. Yeah, so the there's there's a whole other video from the end of COVID yeah. that is available on YouTube. You can tune into that whole session briefly. E is optimizing our environment, sunshine during the day, sleep in complete darkness, barefoot on bare earth, nature connection, and mitigating uh, non-native EMF exposure because we are energy beings. We enter into resonance with different energy fields. So when you're fully, um, you know, if you're at Jesus levels, you can be in crowded cities and you can, do, you know, you don't need these okay. things. Yeah. But until then, why make things unnecessarily difficult for yourself? Like, what are the low hanging fruit things that can help you optimize your nervous system and your physiology? And these are the lowest hanging fruit things to start first. And then the breath work we talk about A is um, the breathing, air, the hydration, the agua. The eating, not just what we eat, but how we eat the umph. My husband gets credit for coming up with umph. And then also our social life, our amigos. Those are essential nutrients for our health and well-being. So let's show up with conscious awareness of the breath and the hydration and the mindful approach to our eating practice with joy, with love, without all the rigid militant, like, oh, my way is the best diet and yours sucks. It's like, oh, come on, you guys, you know? So there's a lot there to uncover just with the AGA. And ultimately that leads us to having the foundation so that things like a water fast or a juice cleanse or a, broth, a week of broths, or um, some people like to do like simplify with a mono diet for a few days, just to like give their digestion a simplified break so that you can focus on healing all the other things. And when we do that, might as well stack functions because when you're juicing, you're more heighten in your awareness. So be extra aware of the information, do some digital detox, be mindful about what kind of conversations, what kind of books, what kind of information fields you enter into resonance with. You'll really feel a heightened sensitivity with all of that. So it won't be difficult to be like, oh, I don't really want to watch that scary murders movie. Like that feels like not kind in my nervous system right now, you know? 
not that you have to be living in a bubble. It's just give yourself a break. Mm -hmm. Our systems are so overloaded. Don't you guys feel kind of overloaded? I'm sure everybody in our communities of like looking at truth or information is like, give yourself a break, man. (laughs) Well, that's what I experienced on my on my uh, 15 day water fast is naturally I wanted to lighten up. That's the that's the L um, for H-E-A-L is lighten up. I naturally wanted to when I was doing this water fast. I was very, very aware of the, com- just like you're saying, the conversations I was having, the information I was consuming. I, I, I was naturally so opposed to anything that was, that was toxic to my system in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it unfolded naturally for you to the T, which is truth and mm-hmm. thoughts like working with our stressful thoughts and limiting thoughts and old traumas, you know, these things bubble up naturally. Yeah. Finally, you can feel all that needs to be felt that for whatever reason, we had to suppress it just to function in the society. And so I have deep appreciation and respect that we function as well as we do, given the circumstance of how messed up and backwards and upside down this reality has been so far. Uh, it's like, isn't it amazing that against all odds, we're all doing as well as we do? It's amazing. And we can do better. So let's do better. So in this kind of spaciousness, we create the sacred space where it's like, oh, I'm eating really clean and I'm my system is recalibrated. My nervous system can handle the deeper, um, important work of working with old stressful thoughts and stories and really listening to the inner truth and inner guidance system. So what we started with, with the age coming home to ourselves gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper as the weeks progress. And finally, what's left is that you can't help but just be in love with life to radiate beautiful, loving energies into your communities. And there's some practices of dropping into your heart for those deeper soul level guidance. Versus like you you can, your body will tell you what works for you, what doesn't work for you for more like mundane, everyday inner calibration of your truth meter. But for big decisions in life, like, should I change my career? Should I move to a different country? You know, what is, what is my soul's purpose in this life? At the end of all this journey, you can drop deeply into your hearts and be awakened in that sense of, you know, being attuned into your divine purpose in this physical life. So this H-E-L-T-H journey meets people wherever they are. Like there are people that just come in and they just, you know, they want to uh, lose 10 pounds and fit into skinny jeans. And that happens for them, too. But it turns out it's not like they didn't have to go on any diet or anything. They just realign themselves from the inside out and they show up as a joyful, vibrant, sexy human being that looks great in a bathing suit. But that beauty is inside and outside Mm now. You know. Mm -hmm. And then there are people that are just like, oh, I just, I always, I've tried to do a juice cleanse like 20 times and I I always fall off the bandwagon. Maybe this time it'll work. And then they realize like, oh, it can be done in such a joyful, natural way because of the stacking, the preparation leading into the L week before we lighten up. We have all this richness of nourishment, the true nutrition that we need, the sunlight, the darkness, the grounding, the true understanding of hydration. The breath work is a huge part of it, right? So then it's like, oh, I hardly even feel hungry. It feels like a natural enfoldment to do a little juicing or cleansing. That just feels intuitively good to me right now. And then people are like, whoa, my psoriasis is gone and years later still gone. Whoa, my menstrual cramps that I had for 20 years is gone. And years later, they still write me and tell me it's gone. I'm not trying to make any medical claims ever in this journey. It's just you recalibrating back to your optimal state of well-being. And all these things just happen as a natural side effect. And many people have these spiritual awakening experiences. And then they're like bending spoons and having remote viewing experiences. And all these like (laughs) supernatural finger quotes things pop up as a natural side effect too. Mm. So it's like, how far do you want to go? Like it's an infinite playground of possibilities now. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's interesting because so much of that resonates with the experience that I just had again, going back to the water fast. And I'm just so excited to invite other people into this simplicity to bring them into alignment, like true alignment with their health. It's, um, cause you know, if we're, if we're wanting to change the world, this, it's like the cliche saying, change yourself to change the world, but it really is so true. When we have people all over the world embodying this simplicity and implementing it in their lives, that sends ripple effects across the entire earth. It really does. Like it, it's showing people a new way of being. And it's so simple. Just requires the stacking of functions, right? Yeah. And then after you stabilize it for a period of time, it's almost a paradox. This is the thing. As we enter into a new consciousness, now we see so many paradoxes in life. So as you stack all these functions, you discover who you really are. Like, what? who am I? How does it feel? How does my life function when I'm in this optimal state of well-being? And then many people tell me, like I have clients who took my super wellness program like five, six, seven, eight years ago even, and they still tell me, they're like, I used to be so rigid and militant about my sleep because I realized like my migraine headaches, my this, my that, all these symptoms, if I don't get at least eight and a half hours of sleep, all of my symptoms will come back. And then they're like, this was a game changer because I had this stacking of so many great wellness support systems in my life. I had to stay up late for this work deadline and it was no problem. Wow. And there's a lot of people who rely so strictly on a specific diet to maintain their health. People with different digestion and allergy type problems. And I totally respect that. If you need to do it, keep doing it. But many people find that once they start having all this holistic support system, they're like, I can eat anything now. What happened? I'm not even allergic to all those things. It's because overall your entire system got all the nourishment and support to have the resilience to recalibrate back to this optimal state so in a lot of what we talk about it's like what is health you know if health is not the absence of symptoms what is health yeah right many people come up with different definitions, but some people might say health is maybe the, not the absence of symptoms, but the ability for me to recalibrate back into my optimal state to meet the challenges of life and not be so thrown off my center so easily. Yeah. In fact, to, to allow the challenges of life to help me to grow stronger and wiser and fitter, just like an athlete will exercise. Yeah. To get stronger, if you way over exercise, you could injure yourself. If you're a couch potato, you're not going to get strong. There's a a sweet spot there. Yeah. Right? So so how do we cultivate that level of fitness and adaptability in all the aspects of life and in our physiology? Well, it turns out having this kind of well-rounded but also super simple approach allows people to not have to be so rigid and militant in any one of those things. You've just opened up all these options for yourself. So now you can travel, you can enjoy life more, you have the fluidity, you have the flexibility. You don't have to be like, you know, poo-pooing on the party because it's like, oh, I have to, I have to tuck into bed or my whole life is going to be ruined forever (laughs) because you know that you have so many redundancies baked into your lifestyle now. So you can just be fun at parties again, you know? Yeah. So infinite possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, that's like, the main thing with this this work is is bringing the fun and the joy back into it too like i feel like a lot of people when they have their holistic health waking i know i'm laughing i was laughing because you're describing kylie and i at various points in time where we're like oh we can't go there to that place because they're going to be serving this food and if we eat that we're going to get inflamed and feel like crap for the next week and a half and it's like 
that whole mindset doesn't sound very healthy either, though, ironically. And it's like when you stack all these functions, you have all these redundancies, as you said, you don't have to worry about that. I think like Melissa Sell says it best. I asked her this on my podcast. I was like, how do you approach diet understanding that like the mental, emotional, psycho, spiritual aspect is the more fundamental thing at play here? And she said, you know, when I'm at home, I eat according to how my body thinks or how I think that my body should be eating. And I, you know, eat as close to natural as I can. But when I travel, I'm going to have a freaking pizza. <laughs> like I'm, I'm going to eat a pizza if I'm somewhere and they have a really good pizza. I'm going to enjoy it. And it's like, wow, that sounds like a very healthy, balanced approach. And it's because Melissa, as you know well, understands exactly what we're describing here very, very well. She does. Yeah. yeah. So the the two big words in our community are awake and freedom. Yeah. This is freedom that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It is. Like, Want to be free? Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Well, we've gone like almost two hours. This was, and it went by really fast. So, um, yeah, I'll, obviously, I, I recorded in the intro already a description of what we're offering for this. But uh, for those who are interested, again, August 22nd, Dr. Edith and I will be starting this uh, super wellness journey via a six week journey, really seven weeks, because we have one week in the middle that is a, that is a break integration period. Um, and it'll be two classes a week, Tuesdays and Saturdays. And we really look forward to seeing you there. I think. This is a, an amazing opportunity for, for our audiences and just for the holistic health, truth, or freedom community at large to really begin to embody a, a new way of being. And yeah, so look forward to having you join us on August 22nd. Yeah, it's going to be an interactive experiential journey. You know, we're going to drop the over obsession with data and analytics and, yeah. and really drop into the data and um, inner awareness and drop into the inner answers that's already within us. Yeah. And so if this sounds like your cup of tea, we'd love for you to join us. And because it's a interactive experience, uh, there's a lot of beauty and spontaneous magic that I'm looking forward to as we interact and share our own personal journeys as we move through the H-E-A-L-T-H journey together. I always learn something new from everyone that joins these groups. So super excited to meet you guys and for me to learn from you also. Yeah. Dr. Yeah, I got to give a shout out to you again. Thank you for finally joining me on an episode for the first time in a while. And yeah, people can put a put a face to the name for how much I've mentioned you on the show. So you're like a co-host without being a co-host in a weird way. So yeah, yeah, this is this is fun. And I love it. I'm your biggest fan, as you know. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being in my life and thank you for collaborating in this six weeks together. No, Super I'm pumped. excited for it. So excited for it. Okay. Well, love you and uh see you guys on August 22nd. See you guys soon.